Hey everyone, my name is Daniel and welcome back to the finance channel. I hope all of you are having a great day out there as always. Here today, I want to do a deep dive into SoFi stock, taking a look at exactly what the business is, how to make money, the potential it has over the long run, take a look at some price targets and come up with an evaluation as to exactly what I'm doing with SoFi stock moving forward. So if you end up enjoying this video and potentially finding some value in it, please consider subscribing. Without further ado here, let's get into the video. So when we look at SoFi as a company, first and foremost, I want to look at the actual business, what they provide and the services that they provide alongside that. And when we look at SoFi, the best way to describe them, at least in my opinion, is an all-in-one finance platform that allows you to do a variety of different finance-related things within one app. Now, again, looking at SoFi here, if you are located within the United States or potentially a market that SoFi operates within, I do recommend you just simply download the app and experience it firsthand, as that is one of the best ways to actually gain conviction in a stock, download the app, experience the service, and uh, potentially experience the product to gain conviction and understanding as to the actual business. But looking at SoFi, they have many different segments of their business, all really tied in to the SoFi app and the SoFi service. First and foremost, you have investing, being able to invest in potentially stocks, cryptocurrencies, ETFs. And I believe they also have an option uh, when this loads here to invest in IPOs at IPO pricing, similar to what Robinhood is doing at this point. But Again, they do have a brokerage aspect of their business, uh, which is great from that standpoint and allows them to compete uh, with potentially the Robin Hoods and the other legacy crypto brokerages of the world. Now, uh, looking out to potentially other services, they are heavily involved in the loan space. First and foremost, you have a uh, personal loans, you have student loan refinancing, uh, then you have a money aspect here. I believe this is a debit card that allows you to earn interest, no fees. Uh, great from that standpoint, again, just kind of adding to the point Point, that SoFi is an all-in-one finance app that takes care of all of your concerns uh, from a finance perspective. Even home loans, you can do that simply from SoFi with just a few clicks. Again, uh, really automating the whole process, making it very easy for people. They uh, do have a SoFi credit card, potentially making money on off of that. Uh, say goodbye to an annual fee and uh, kind of building on top of that. Private uh, student loans, they also have insurance. Now, this aspect of insurance here is not done by SoFi, but what they do instead is take you to other websites like, you know, Ladder, uh, you know, uh, another kind of uh, corporation here for auto insurance, actually Lemonade as well. This is a stock that I looked into back in 2020. Uh, again, so what they do is they redirect you to these insurance places. Like again, uh, potentially Lemonade is one example. They take you to the site. And what they do is they actually earn a referral if you end up using Lemonade as your insurance provider. So uh, they're not really taking care of insurance, which, hey, they might end up doing that in the future, but they're earning a commission, which, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that allows them to generate a profit of some uh, sort, right? Uh, we don't know how big it is, probably not huge, but they uh, kind of uh, make money from that perspective. A uh, credit score and budgeting, this again allows you to take care of this entire aspect all through the uh, SoFi app, making it very easy to track you know exactly what your credit score might happen moving forwards. And lastly, auto loan refinancing. So uh, this is obviously the SoFi business, the things that they offer. And they're, you know, obviously expanded into many different finance related verticals, and uh, they are continuing to expand into many moving forward. So uh, let me know in the comment section down below, first and foremost, before we keep moving on here, what your thoughts are on SoFi as a platform, your experience with them, and you know, how well they've uh, kind of been handling these things like potentially investing or credit scores or insurance or loans, what has been your experience? Because again, I'm personally located within Canada and I can't get a firsthand experience. So, you know, let me know. Uh, all I know is that this company is growing significantly. And from my understanding, users of the platform do like it. But uh, kind of looking at SoFi from, again, a more of an in-depth perspective, diving in deep into the numbers. We'll take a look at the valuation in a moment here. But we can see that a majority of their revenues currently come from the lending segment of their business. And this is actually very interesting here. I just want to point to a few things. Here is uh, on the top line here, I don't know how big this is or how small this is, a student loan or originations, personal loan originations, and home loan originations, or a kind of total originations on the kind of front of loans. And we can see that from 2018 to 2020, this number has decreased year over year over over here, but despite this decrease, we have seen an increase in revenue 
coming from uh, the lending aspect of their business, showing that uh, they're uh, kind of being able to monetize this segment of their business more and more, despite it actually shrinking from the perspective of more origination. So that's great to see from that standpoint. I do believe that there is opportunity for this to rebound here over the coming years. But, uh, you know, besides that, Great to see SoFi taking advantage of this opportunity to make more money from loans, despite it kind of stagnating from that standpoint. Then you have a technology platform segment, uh, roughly $95 million in revenue in 2020, again, compared to roughly half a billion from the uh, lending segment of their business. Uh, this is much more profitable over a 50% uh, gross profit margin, uh, kind of from this perspective, the technology platform segment of their business. And then financial services. Now, although this is the smallest aspect of their business, it takes up the most amount of money and capital as it is the service and kind of sector that they are currently plugging a lot of money into to innovate rapidly and compete with the big dogs. Now, when we look at, again, uh, what the financial service segment is, it is kind of described here in the footnote. Uh, I just want to kind of point to this here. In our financial services segment, total products refers to the number of SoFi money accounts, SoFi invest accounts, SoFi credit card accounts, SoFi at work accounts, and SoFi relay accounts. So uh, that's kind of that aspect of their business. In my opinion, invest is one of the bigger ones there. There you also have credit cards, a lot of newer things that have yet to come to fruition and really make an impact on SoFi's revenue as a business. Either way, uh, this is the fastest growing part of a SoFi's revenue and in my opinion, it will continue to explode over the coming years as they uh, continue to expand in these rapidly uh, kind of growing categories that they're uh, kind of plugging into. But now we understand SoFi as a business, the growth they've been experiencing, the verticals that they are in. Let's take a look at their balance sheet and we'll take a look at their operating income statement uh, shortly after that. So looking at the company's balance sheet, we'll see that they have roughly, uh, I want to say $700 million in cash slash restricted cash that they've potentially used uh, through their loaning program. Again, uh, when we look at kind of their balance sheet, you'd have to consider that these loans here and uh, the debt here kind of cancel each other out. You do have roughly $420 million in accounts payable, accruals, and other liabilities. That's the main one you want to focus in on, at least at this point. But you know, so far at this point, from my understanding, although the balance sheet isn't phenomenal, I want to say that it's pretty decent given the company size and the growth that they're experiencing. Nothing too bad from this perspective. Not great, not bad, kind of in the middle, at least in my opinion. So uh, this is the balance sheet here. Nothing too big to worry about in my opinion. Now, next thing that I want to do with all of you is take a look at SoFi's income statement, where their money is coming from and where their money is going. And we can see that after factoring in all revenue for Q1 of 2021, it comes out to around $200 million in revenue, of which $66 million million dollars is spent on technology and product development. Again, innovating, expanding their product lineup, $87 million on sales and marketing, growing their user base, which we'll take a look at in a moment here, 57 million uh, for cost of operation. So again, that's, you know, roughly, I want to say a 70% gross margin after cost of operations. And obviously after that, you have these different expenses, but a general and administrative expenses, this is the big one here. And this jumped significantly from 2020, despite despite a not so significant jump in total net revenue in the sense that sure revenue grew by around two and a half X while general and administrative general and administrative expenses grew by over three X. So in my opinion, hopefully we have some one-time expenses there. And this is something that if you are uh, potentially interested in uh, seriously investing in SoFi stock, I do recommend you check this out. Not too big of an issue in my opinion, as they're simply spending money that will benefit the company in a major way at some point in the future. Either way, we do get to a net loss of roughly $177 million, significant loss compared to their revenues. Again, in my opinion, uh, partially because of some one-time expenses. That's at least my understanding on this whole situation. So, uh, you know, we took a look at a majority of the things. We can also take a look here at uh, the members of the SoFi platform now sitting at over two point, you know, I'm assuming 2.3 uh, million users uh, of the SoFi platform at this point. And you can see that year over year growth when it comes to members 
members has not only been growing quarter over quarter since late 2019, but the percentage of which it's growing at has also been ex uh, kind of expanding exponentially, which is great to see. Uh, the company is obviously investing a ton into marketing, which will, again, uh, that's just an investment into the future and uh, will help the company reap big rewards uh, three, five years down the road once these uh, potential customers really uh, migrate to the platform and uh, potentially use a lot of the SoFi products as, again, SoFi, one of the great things about them is that, hey, they potentially acquire a customer for so much money, but you know, after that, they expand to SoFi. They use one product. Maybe they expand into lending, car insurance, things along those lines. You got a situation where it's uh, you kind of acquire, and then after that, you expand which in my opinion presents a great growth opportunity to where, yeah, sure, members growing, that's phenomenal, but on top of that, expanding uh, the amount of revenue these customers generate will happen naturally as they expand into new products and new services that SoFi offers as a platform. So, hey, we just took a look at SoFi from a business perspective, expanding rapidly with the amount of products that they offer and expanding the amount of members that they have. They are unprofitable, trading at roughly a $12.83 billion valuation at this point in time. From my understanding, this is a little bit higher. Keep in mind the shares outstanding count roughly 865 million from my understanding. A Yahoo Finance does get it wrong sometimes, but again, roughly a $13 billion valuation at this point for a company that is not profitable. So and this kind of leads me into my next segment, which is the company's valuation and potentially making certain price targets, looking out five years down the road, uh, or I guess closer to four years at this point, back or into the back half of 2025. But looking at SoFi, it's obviously an unprofitable company. And this is true for many companies out there in the stock market at this point. You know, there's many that you can mention, stocks like Palantir, which are yet to to kind of expand profitability and are currently focusing in on growth. And that is something that is true for SoFi and many companies out there. So when valuing a company that is not yet profitable, it's really, really important to understand that the market isn't valuing SoFi based off of the profit numbers that they're doing here today, and instead are valuing the company based off of potential profitability three to five years down the road. Sure, they're doing maybe a billion dollars in revenue here in 2021. That's not going to be profitable here today, but as the company matures, as they uh, potentially make more money off of revenue, that billion dollars will potentially generate $100, $200 million in net income three to five years down the road, which is what we're going to value SoFi at here today. At least that's kind of my understanding of this whole business. But either way, it's difficult to understand and value SoFi, but I'm going to try and do it. And what I'm going to use as a bit of a, a kind of basis for my understanding in here is, um, I'm not uh, sure if uh, some of you are familiar with Chamath. This is obviously, I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name, but uh, heavily involved in Facebook in the early days. And he's been responsible for a lot of SPACs recently, Virgin Galactic, uh, Clover Health, or Clover Health, I think it is, a variety of different SPACs that have gone public here over the past, uh, I want to say, couple of months, year or two here, roughly. And uh, looking at SoFi, it did go public through one of Chamath's SPACs. So uh, Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation, Rather, the company simply merges with SoFi, changes the ticker symbol, and they're automatically public. Great. And looking at Chamath, he has an in-depth understanding as to exactly what's going on at each of the businesses that merge with one of his special purpose acquisition corps, and SoFi is no different. Looking at his sheet, and this is uh, given pretty much right when he announced uh, when IPOE was merging with SoFi, he gave us a lot of interesting projections and potential guidance. Again, this isn't coming straight from the company, but it's coming from someone heavily involved at the company. So we can, at least in my opinion, use these figures to come up with potential valuation targets. Now, really important to understand that this may be a bit of a rosy scenario, just because when we look at investor presentations, when we look at uh, potentially someone pitching a stock, they generally look at the best case scenario and uh, potentially don't factor in much risk, which in my opinion is kind of what's happening here. But either way, let's go through exactly what I have here. Uh, Chamath and actually uh, uh, SoFi has said this, they expect to do just under a billion dollars in revenue here in 2021. And I have net income blank here from 2021 to 2023, because I personally don't really expect them to generate a significant profit in those years. Hey, 2024 may not even be this high, but Either way, they're expecting just under a billion dollars in revenue in 2021, and analysts are, fo are forecasting roughly $1.5 billion in revenue in 2022. This may be a little bit low, but either way, 
we get to a situation where by 2025, we have revenue of just under $3.7 billion, or an average revenue growth rate of just under 40%. Again, this company has been growing significantly more than this over the past couple of years. And sitting at just over 2 million users, there is a lot of potential here for this company to expand significantly over the next 5, 10 years. As you know, you picture something like Coinbase, right? Right? Involved just in the cryptocurrency space, sitting at over 50 million verified users. This company has a lot of potential. Either way, $3.67 billion in revenue by 2025. Now, the next thing is profitability. What is profitability by then? Or hey, what is potential profitability? If they don't hit these numbers, I think the market may look at them as, again, a potential profitability situation, which is what's kind of been happening here with a lot of these uh, unprofitable tech growth companies out there. But what Chamath here is saying, and this is very interesting, that by the time 2025 comes around, we can expect roughly a 32% adjusted EBITDA margin at the company. Now, again, this is not net income, and that is very important to understand. This is adjusted EBITDA. Now, I'm going to factor in roughly 12% extra expenses. Again, adjusted EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciations, and amortizations. And again, adjusted EBITDA, not just EBITDA. So a lot of this uh, simply makes this a, a more kind of, again, I, I like using the word rosier because that's exactly what it is. It makes the number look a little bit better than it is. So, hey, I'm going to use 12%, which essentially shaves off a little over a third of uh, kind of this EBITDA margin here and giving us a potential net income margin of just around 20% factoring in roughly maybe a 25% tax rate thereabout, and uh, potentially maybe, uh, I don't know, 5% of total revenue uh, going down to things like, again, depreciations, amortizations, interest expenses, or other things that fall under the adjusted EBITDA category. Now, this gives us a potential profitability scenario, of, again, roughly $734 million in net income by year 2025. And this is where things get interesting. Again, the company currently trading at roughly a $14.3 billion valuation, assuming that they don't really issue issue more shares over the next five years, which, hey, they're just turning profitable. So given that the business will probably start funding themselves or the business will start funding it itself over the next couple of years here, there may not be a reason or there may not be a reason rather uh, for an increase in the share outstanding count. But either way, I'm going to assume this sits at $865 million. The current valuation here sits at just over $14 billion. And if we use a PE ratio of 40, which we'll talk about this in a moment, multiply this by net income, we get roughly a $30 billion valuation or price upside of just over 100% over the next five years. And uh, this is where things, again, take a little bit of a turn. A 40 price to earnings ratio is higher than a majority of established tech companies trade at. And you got to understand that five years from now, SoFi is going to be much more mature and have experienced a lot of the growth or rather the potential growth uh, that the company will experience over the next decade. Sure, uh, we do kind of look at these companies as a bit of an S curve where they experience exponential growth and then eventually it flattens off. I don't think that's going to flatten off for SoFi until at least 2030, if not even later, at least uh, in my opinion, from my understanding. But looking at SoFi here at a 40 PE ratio, which is rather high, and assuming this rosy scenario of, again, Chamath, he's pitching the stock to investors of $3.7 billion in revenue by 2025 and a 20% net income margin, which, you know, it, but hey, if they don't hit that, that's fine because investors will probably look at this company anyways from a potential profitability perspective. You still get a situation where it's only a double up. And when I invest in a stock, hey, if you use a 30 PE ratio, it's only 50% upside. So when I look at this company, it hits all the boxes when it comes to the actual platform, the services that they offer and what they provide as a business. But what I do not personally like is the valuation. It just comes down to that. A company can be incredible, but if the valuation isn't there, you're probably not going to make money off of it. And hey, if you invest in SoFi, I'm not saying you're not going to make money. Again, this will probably track the tech market. And hey, it's probably going to go up over the next five years, maybe even more than my uh, kind of uh, valuation uh, machine here shows me or whatever you want to call it here. But either way, I personally do not want to invest in a company that if I assume a rosy scenario over the next five years for revenues and profits, and I have to assume a 40 price to earnings ratio only earns me a double up, I personally do not want to take that risk and I can find better opportunities out there. So the, I guess the bottom line of this video and what comes down to exactly what I'm doing with the stock, I like the company. 
I like exactly what they're doing. And I think the revenue growth and the growth that they're experiencing is absolutely amazing. But despite that growth and assuming this rosy scenario, we still get a situation where there are a lot of better opportunities out there. And I think this, again, the bottom line is that SoFi, although they're great, I personally see better opportunities out there. So I'm not going to be investing in SoFi stock, you know, at this moment, hey, if the stock potentially corrects over the next potentially couple of years, fundamentals improve, hey, there may be a bit of a better opportunity there now, but or at that point in time, but currently I cannot justify myself buying SoFi stock at this valuation where they still have a lot to prove and even using the best case scenario numbers, it's only a double up. So anyways, guys, thank you all so much for watching this video. Let me know in the comment section down below what your thoughts are on SoFi stock. I hope I'm not sounding too negative in this video, but you gotta understand that, you know, it may be a great company, but if the valuation isn't there, that is a risk worth noting and potentially comparing to other opportunities out there in the stock market. So anyways, thank you all so much for being here. If you found some value in this video, please consider subscribing. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.